I'm going to talk about the CRA role in risk-based monitoring today and strategies for effective remote monitoring. I'm going to put my little profile up here, my quick little profile. I started as a coordinator, did that for many years in academia here in New York City, and then transitioned to industry first as a CRA, study manager, and so on. You can see the little profile on the slide here. Okay, so what we're going to take a look at, we're going to look at strategies for saving time and money without really compromising oversight and quality. Okay, and that's, you know, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do, quite frankly. I, you know, it's been said many times, and I remember one of the new VPs that we had in one of our companies that I worked for when I worked for Big Pharma came in and said, well, you know, there are three things that we always want, right? We want to come in on budget. We want to have good quality data. And we want to be on time. And basically, you can get two out of the three, but you can almost never get the three without sacrificing one of the others. So the whole idea is really to kind of take a look at that and see, you know, the challenges that we have. How are we going to address those? We're seeing more and more, and especially today now, we're seeing more and more technology. And now we're almost being forced to use a lot more technology than we had in the past with this whole COVID-19, with people you know, are not able to get into sites to monitor, coming up with new ways to do source data verification, new ways to kind of think, rethink how we have done trials in the past. So we're kind of in a whole new world, and I think we're going to start looking at a variety of different approaches as we progress through this time period. Okay, so the objectives are up here, basically looking at approaches and techniques for remote data review, looking at techniques for query writing to ensure that we have clear communication of issues, and implementing strategies to identify problem areas and how to maximize time on site following remote monitoring. And today we're really in an environment where we're probably not on site very much. I know here in New York, most institutions are not permitting any monitors to go in to their institutions. Here, you know, we have a little cartoon here saying the computer says I need to upgrade my brain to be compatible with its new software. I mean, I'm sure that we've all encountered all of our own technological challenges. I had one just yesterday when I was trying to teach a course where I went through three laptops before I could actually find a connection that would actually work. So between Wi-Fi issues and software issues, Okay, I usually joke with my husband and tell him that he needs a brain upgrade because he's he's not very technical, technologically savvy, and that's fine that if you're not, he doesn't deal in this kind of environment, but it's so difficult to sometimes keep up with things. You have a new operating platform, and it doesn't really sync with everything else. So again, we have all these challenges coming up. Back in the day of 100% source data verification, when we all used to go to the sites, it could be the days of paper trials, but even in the days of electronic data capture, that we were using 100% source data verification. We checked every single data point. Now, with risk-based monitoring, we're trying to be a little smarter about things. We need to assess our risk and figure out what we really need to source data verify, what do we need to look at 100%, and what can we look at less? There have been studies done that have proven that 100% source document verification does not really yield necessarily much better results. A lot of the things that are missed are, you know, very minor issues that really don't impact the data or the outcome of a study. All right, so we have to look and see the risk. So, for example, let's say we have a drug, and we expect this drug to Maybe we're not expecting it to cure, but maybe we're expecting it to reduce tumor size by 50%. Well, I would say that the measurements that we're taking at each of those visits are going to be critical, and that's something that we are probably going to want to check 100% across the board. Okay? Perhaps there's some other issues with the study that we don't have to actually verify 100% across the board. So, again, we're taking an approach of what's the risk. We also look at what's the risk of something happening. We try to think of the worst case scenario. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? What can we put in place to prevent it from happening? And if it does happen, what's the impact? What is the impact of the study? So these are the kind of questions. What is the risk? 
how likely is it to happen, and what is the impact if it does happen. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we want to take a look at. We also want to take a look at trends across sites to determine risk. So we have that overall risk that we, we kind of take into account, as I just mentioned, the protocol risk. So we're looking, we're looking to see that impact. You know, one of the things that we, I always use as an example, almost for every study, we have one risk factor that we always have to consider. Will we fill enrollment on our timeline? The answer to that for most studies is no, okay? Unless you're doing an obesity trial or a vaccine trial, which those tend to fill pretty quickly, most of the trials do not fill in the appropriate amount of time. So the risk of that happening is fairly high. What's the impact if it does happen? So, and how can we mitigate that risk? So again, the impact of it happening, okay, we may have to add more sites. We will extend our timeline probably. So that's all time and money that's going to be at risk there. But we can put things in place to plan. Maybe we have a number of backup sites that are ready to go so that we're not going to increase the timeline terribly much. We will increase the financial part, though. So again, that's sort of just one kind of very simple example of the risk that we encounter or we can encounter for, for our studies. Same thing goes for the, the monitoring. What is the risk of missing a particular data point? What's the end point? What's the impact of that particular thing happening? So we have that broad base in terms of the risk assessment for the actual protocol. But then we get down to another level where you come into play as a CRA, and you're very important in this role, assessing your individual sites. You could have a site that is very experienced, does excellent work, a high enroller, always has very good, clean quality data. And then you could have another site that is relatively new to research that you're just starting to use. So are we going to monitor them in the same way? Probably not. So again, you're going to give some feedback. Presumably your company will allow you to give some feedback in terms of, you know, maybe you need to get out a little more often with that newer site or with a site that's just gone through some sort of transition. In other words, they lost a coordinator, they've now hired a new coordinator, and until you're more comfortable with that site, doing a little more intensive source data verification and more intensive monitoring, okay? So again, the, the different levels of the risk assessment are both at that protocol level and then with the actual individual sites. Can you all chat in or any of you chat in some of your experiences in terms of just this piece of it. Have you had that experience where you've given feedback, you've had maybe a risk assessment in terms of your protocol, what you need to look at, in terms of the number of um, visits or the amount of source documentation you need to review versus the type of sites you have? Can you chat in any experiences that you might have had? <laughs> 